Chapter 24 The Moravians or the Moravian Brothers of the Order of the Religious Freemasons, or Order of the Mustard Seed, or the Church Unitas Fratrum, or Herrenhuta. Margrave Albert expelled the Jews from the town of Iglau in Moravia, on the ground that they had been in league with the Taborites, the subversive element among the Hussites. The Taborites were Bohemians. The Moravian Brothers, or Unitas Fratrum, agnostic sect, were founded in 1457 at Kunewald near Seftenberg by Gregory, the nephew of the Kalikstein leader Roxiana. They were an offshoot of the Bohemian Brethren said to represent the religious kernel of the Hussite movement. At the Synod of Lata near Reichenau in 1467, they constituted themselves into a church separate from the Kalix. Calixtine or National Church of Bohemia. The constitution of the society was revised at a second synod held at Lata near the direction of the Duke of under the direction of the Luke of Prague. I'm pretty sure that's wrong and supposed to say Duke, but I'm not really completely sure. Anyway, it's spelled Luke of Prague. Who may be regarded as their second founder? This reorganization enabled the society to grow rapidly. In the early years of the 16th century, Unitas included 400 congregations in Bohemia and Moravia, with 150,000 members, and including Poland embraced three provinces, Bohemia, Moravia, where the Jews are the best educated of the inhabitants, and in a few small towns from a full half of the population and Poland. Each province had its own bishops and synods, but all were united in one church and governed by the general synod. The Lutheran movement in Germany awakened lively interest among the brethren, and some unsuccessful attempts were made under the leadership of Augusta to unite with the Lutheran Church in 1528-1546. But when the Calvinist Reformation reached Bohemia, the Brethren found themselves more in sympathy with it than with the Lutheran. The Jesuit anti-Reformation, instigated by Rudolf and his brothers Matthias and Ferdinand, found the Brethren a prosperous church. But the pitiless persecution which followed the unsuccessful attempt at revolution crushed the whole pro Protestantism of Bohemia, and in 1627 the evangelical churches there had ceased to exist. About the same time, the Polish branch of the unity, in which many refugees from Bohemia and Moravia had found a home, was absorbed, was absorbed and the Reformed Church of Poland, a few Families, however, especially in Moravia, held religious services in secret, preserved the traditions of their fathers, and in spite of the vigilance of their enemies, maintained some correspondence with each other. In 1722, some of these left home and property to seek a place where they could worship in freedom. The first company, led by Christian David, a mechanic, settled by invitation from Count Zinzendorf on his estate at the Bertelsdorf near Zittau in Saxony. They were soon joined by others, about 300 coming within seven years, and built, it, and built a town. I'm sorry, I had to interrupt because something was messing with my phone. I'm reading from my phone. Excuse me. About 300 coming within seven years, and built a town which they called Herrenhut, the small community at first adopted the constitution and teaching of the old unitas. The episcopate had been continued, and in 1735, David Nitschmann was consecrated first bishop of the rene renewed Moravian church. The new settlement was not, however, destined to be simply a revival of the organization of the Bohemian Brethren. Sinzendorf, who had given them an asylum, came with his wife, family, and chaplain to live among the refugees. He was a Lutheran who had accepted Spen Spener's pietism, and he wished to form a society distinct from national churches and devoted to good works. After long negotiations, a union was effected between the Lutheran element 
and the adherents of the ancient Unitas Fratrum, the immigrants at Herrenhut attended the parish church at Bertelsdorf and were simply a Christian Gnostic society within the Lutheran church, Ecclesiola in Ecclesia. This peculiarity is still to some extent preserved in the German branch of the church, and the Moravian Brethren's congregation within the evangelical Protestant churches, which enables them to do evangelistic work without proselytizing, the society adopted a code of rules in 1727 and ordained 12 elders to carry on pastoral work. This was the revival of the Unitas Fratrum as a church. Besides congregational work, special home missions were and are carried in carried I'm sorry. Special home missions were and are carried on in each province. In the German province there is a peculiar home mission called the Diaspora, which dates from eighteen twenty nine. The Moravians came to England in seventeen twenty four, brought by Count Zinzendorf. The following extract from the work of an Anglican bishop written in 1751 shows that they were not particularly appreciated in that country as a force for good. Of what dangerous consequence the Moravian system is to government and civil society appears by their progressive multiplicity of prevarications, lies, frauds, cheats, and juggling impostures greatly detrimental to princes and states, as well as ruinous to private persons, which have so plainly been proved by Mr. Remius and others, particularly in the history of the Moravians, very lately published from the public acts of Budingen and other authentic vouchers. Of this nature are there devouring the whole substance of any wealthy convert, and declaring that the society may say to a young rich brother, either give up all that thou hast, or get thee gone. Sending away any of the society to the remotest parts of the world at a minute's warning, by the authority of the Savior who will have it done post-haste, whereby any, though his majesty's subjects whom they suspect, or that dislike their proceedings, or for prudential reasons must be married up, or may discover any of their inequities, are instantly sent into banishment, and condemned to transportation, not for any crime, but for their virtue and duty, which is more than all the authority of Great Britain can do for any crime. Without an open and legal trial, making marriages void, though before contracted, unless the carnal cohabitation has been performed in the presence of the elders, seducing men's wives and daughters, and then keeping them by force or sending them out of the way, and allowing no power of, the, of earth to reclaim them, though the parents beg it on their knees, taking away the natural authority of the parents, and making their children disobey and renounce them, under pretense of obeying the Savior, the Father that created them, thereby making the fifth commandment of no effect, sometimes bribing and sometimes threatening states as occasion serves, and denouncing argumenta regem, if they are opposed, and telling princes that such or such a place in their dominions was founded by the Savior for his theocracy, which he won't fail to maintain. These things have been proved upon the Marod Moravians, both to doctrine and practice by diverse instances. Uh, excuse me, by diverse instances. Oh, I got to take a short break and say sometimes the language is very uh, strange, and uh, um, there's a few um, uh, spelling mistakes, so that's why it's kind of funny sometimes to read. So I'll stop. I'll stop bitching, okay? I'm going on. And that, in fact, they claim an independency on government appears from the letter to the Regency of Budingen from the Count Zinzendorf and his brethren, wherein it is said in plain terms that all the sovereigns on earth must consent to the theocracy in the Moravian Brotherhood or have no brethren in their dominions. I need not add that theocracy signifies an immediate government by God which of course excludeth all civil authority. 
The Moravian dogma was spiritism, which generally means black magic. As for their moral code, it can be summarized in the few following words of Count Zinzendorf in a dialogue with Mr. Wesley. We reject all self-denial. We trample it underfoot. We believers do what we please and no more. Claiming to be free from all law by their marriage with Christ, they refuse to be bound by any law at all, either of the Old Testament or the New. To bring all sects under his sway, Roman Catholics, Socinians, fanatics, Chileists, Anabaptists, etc., Count Sinzendorf made a new translation of the New Testament, which was practice of almost all the Gnostic heretics in order to de deceive and draw disciples, nor did they make any scruple of omissions, espongings, or any corruptions that might serve their purpose. Missionaries were sent abroad, everything being done by the Savior's injunction. Heaven for them is to consist in their being metaphorced into female angels for a carnal enjoyment of Christ and his human nature in the eternal bedchamber. <laughs> Where in the scriptures do you find panegyrical hymns in honor of your phallus, asks Lavington. For what follows, we refer the reader to page 140 of the bishop's book. Count Zinzendorf is said to have been the head of the Rose Craw from 1744 to 1749. He was on intimate terms with John Wesley, the founder of Methodism. Of all its names... That of the Order of Religious Freemasons is the most significant today. It should also be remembered that the head of this order was also the head of the esoteric Rosicrucians of the time. <clears throat> okay, just one comment before I go on to chapter 25. My screen broke on my phone, <laughs> so sometimes I'm... It's kind of hard to read. I need to get it. I need to get it fixed. So I'm sorry. I'm I'm just complaining again. <laughs> okay, let's go on. Chapter 25, The Anabaptists, founded in 1521. The Anabaptists were founded in 1521 by Nicholas Storch, Mark Stubner, and Thomas Munzer. The Hirsis were founded on the following Lutheran maxim, interpreted subversively. A Christian man is master of everything and is subject to no one. They further claim that infant baptism is null, therefore adults only can be baptized. If the Anabaptist writes Hönighaus, a German Protestant writer in La Reforme contre la Reforme, were not, only, were not all equally intolerant, they were nevertheless all equally detested, hated, persecuted by the Protestants much more than by the Catholics. Queen Elizabeth ordered them to be excluded from England. Madden in Phantasmata describes their religion in the following terms. We find among them claims to intercourse with God and angels, to the gift of prophecy, to the power of driving out evil spirits, to the right of persecuting opponents, to visions, ecstasies, trances, conclusive seizures attributed to supernatural influence, and all these evidences of epidemic religious mania in countries which were Protestant. At certain periods in the history, this sect wielded great power, and Madden further writes that in Westphalia, for a length of time, the entire Senate was composed of theomaniacs. As a republic was composed alone of fools and madmen, it is incredible to what a length they carry their excesses in Munster. Each magistrate proposed for the rule of government the wild chimeras of his own imagination, disguised under the imposing name of revelation. It was a sad spectacle to hear the deliberations of a senate composed altogether of fanatics some being inspired in a perfectly contrary way to that suggested to others, nevertheless each one adhering to the dictates of his inspiration, because he believed that a special revelation had been made to him. When such things, says Kamil, take place in a country where pseudo-prophets are tolerated, who disseminate terror and run about the streets without any clothing, when the multitude set 
these things down as a superhuman phenomena, when the inspired of both sexes walk about thus in public places in the midst of their disciples and apostles, the will of the supreme being is supposed to serve as a rule and direction to all the extravagances that mortals fall into, and it is difficult to say where will end the excesses of this religious delirium. The Anabaptists, when they fall into the hands of their enemies, allowed their fingers, tongues, nose, and ears to be cut off, nay, even suffered themselves to be drowned by hundreds in torrents, rather than deus desist or depart for a moment from the orders they imagined came from God. In 1525, Luther headed an alliance of the princes and governments to repress these excesses, and they were defeated at the Battle of Frankenhausen. Frankenhausen in that year, their leader, Thomas Munzer, being seized and beheaded. In 1536, John of Leyden proclaimed himself king of the New Jerusalem, but his glory was short of short duration. He was taken by the ungodly and put to death. The principal leaders of the sect were John Matthias, John Bockholt, David George, William Hackett, Cotterus, Kuhlmann, and Dabrisius. The principal offshoots of the Anabaptist fanaticism in Germany, Holland, and Switzerland were the Adamites, the Apostolics, the Taciturn, the Perfect, the Impeccable, the Liberated Brethren, the Sabbatarians, the Clancolarians, the Manifestarians, the Bewailers, the Rejoicers, the Indifferent, the, <laughs> the Sanguinarians, and the Antimarians. Oh my goodness. <laughs> okay, that was chapter 25. Chapter 26, The Grand Lodge of England, founded in 1717. John Valentin Andrea, the Rosicrucian, having elaborated a plan to merge all the existing religious societies into one organization, published in 1614 a book, Universal and General Reformation of the Whole Wide World, in which he advocated the foundation of a secret society of all classes pledged to work quietly for the benefit of their fellows. To this period also belongs the legend of Christian Rosenkreuz, see page 151. Andrea, however, failed in his endeavors, but Jan Amos Komensky, Komenius, joined actively in his efforts and as early as 1628 begged, to, begged leave to share in his work, in this work of which he presently was given sole charge. About this time, Komenius wrote his renowned work on all wisdom, the Pansophia, which embodied his ideas on the foundation of humanity's utopia. This Moravian schoolmaster, Comenius, while doubtless an idealist, was also interested in spiritism, prophecies, revolution, antichrist, the millennium, and such like winds of a dangerous fanaticism. He collected the visions of the Anabaptist, Cauterus, and those of Dab and published them at Amsterdam. Those visions promised such wonders as the extermination of the Pope, the House of Austria, Gustavus Adolphus, Gustavus, King of Sweden, Cromwell, and others, and were the most disturbing character. When Anderson undertook the task of uniting the old traditions of practical masonry with the more recent development and broadened ideas of the New World League, he incorporated in his book of Constitution a reproduction of the main part of the plans and ideas of Comenius. Their true meaning was faithfully adhered to, and important and decisive passages were adopted almost literally. The transformation of the Lodge was actually carried out in 1663 when, in the General Assembly of Masons, the masters of operative masonry, feeling themselves supplanted and overruled, realized that if they did not wish to forsake their lodge, they must unite with its new masters and subordinate themselves to their designs. Henry German, Lord St. Albans, was elected and installed as Grand Master. Sir John Denham became his deputy, and Sir Christopher Wren and John Webb, wardens. The English 
Grand Lodge, as we know it, was founded on June 24, 1717, by Anderson de Saguleur, an expatriated Frenchman said to have been the head of the Rose Croix, Calvert, James King, Elliot Lumden Madden, and George Payne. It works only the first three degrees. Apprenticed, fellow craft, and master mason, blue masonry, the con and constitutes the nursery for the selection of initiates for the higher or so-called spurious masonry. Masons desirous of rising in the ranks of fraternity are therefore obliged to enter ancient and accepted Scottish rites. In England, ancient and accepted rites. Grand Orient, Memphis, and Mizraim, Swedenborg, or some other international order which works the higher grades and selects its members from graduates of the original English system. English masonry claims to be purely charitable institution. It is blue mason masonry which answers to the lesser mysteries of the ancients wherein, in reality, nothing but the exoteric doctrines were revealed, while spurious masonry, or all subsequent degrees, for no one can be initiated into them who has not passed through the first three degrees, answer to the greater mysteries. According to Anderson's own showing, Stater, Freemasonry Universal, previous to the formation of the Grand Lodge in 1717, the ceremonies of the Freemasons were purely Christian, but soon after that important change, it was decided to widen the basis of the craft so that men of all religious persuasions could enter her portals and benefit by her teaching. On page 303, the Rosicrucian and Masonic record can be found the Articles of Union, dated 1813, of the two fraternities of free and accepted Masons of England, the Society of Free and Accepted Masons and the Grand Lodge of the Society of Freemasons. At the same time, Grand Lodge agreed to recognize a fourth degree, that of Holy Arch, of Holy Royal Arch. In these articles, it is specified that the representation of a lodge in Grand Lodge shall be by its actual master, wardens, and one past master only. Prior to the revival in 1717 and the reconstruction of masonry in its present symbolic form, we find in another article in the Rosicrucian and Masonic record that very little is known of the proceedings of Masonic bodies. From the fact that very few written documents were permitted to be recorded, and of these few, owing to the jealousy or overcaution of their rulers, many were burnt in London in 1721. We can accept the cause, causes given above for the destruction of these documents with a smile. On initiation, Masons receive an alias by which name they are henceforth known in the Lodge. All Masonry is founded on the usual systems of sectarian help, Help a Mason supplants the Christian teaching of help everyone. Until the last few years, this rule had not assumed a subversive character. Later, however, it is said that to get anywhere in business in the city of London, one must be a Mason. This has stimulated Masonic recruiting, implying, as it does, a virtual business boycott against non-Masons. Each new recruit weakens the forces of those whose free, unhampered judgment could serve the cause of real liberty, democracy, and humanity. Masonry, English, and Continental has been very useful to persons with political ambitions and minor mental and moral capacities. The Mechanerie Pratique, pratique Corns... Oh my gosh. Okay, these are French words that I cannot pronounce. <laughs> I'm going to try. Corn d'un sommet supérieur de la franc maconnerie. Oh my gosh. <sighs> I need to learn French. Anyway. In this book, <laughs> I'm just going to write, in this book, we are given the following as the esoteric explanation of the ritual of Master Mason, third degree. 
It is an interesting fact that very few of the editions of certain works quoted herein are accessible to the profane public in museums and libraries. I'm so sorry. I just can't help myself. Now I have to laugh at my silly pronunciation. The temple being emblematic of the human body, the master's lodge is known as the middle chamber within which the most intimate mysteries of Freemasonry are celebrated. It represents the uterus wherein is accomplished the reproduction of all beings. The two parts separated longitudinally by a dark curtain represent one side, the west, dark, and lighted only by a single light, the abode of death of the sterile seed is the ovary. That of the eastern side, brilliantly illuminated, is the seed fertilized by the fulfillment of the act of generation and absorbed by the uterus. The master holds the mallet, the two wardens each holding a roll of cardboard nine inches in circumference and eight inch, 18 inches long. These rolls represent the membrum viral. Well, we know what that means, right? In the middle of the lodge is a mattress, coffin, or ditch, which symbolizes the bed. The pastos of the ancients, upon which are performed the mysteries of the human generation. This mattress, coffin, or ditch also represents the Arch of Noah and the ancient Arch of the Old Testament. These two arches being again the symbols of the place where the generation of beings is accomplished. The acacia, the initiatic emblem of the Gauls and the Scandinavians, and the fig tree, the initi initiatic emblem of the Syrians and the Orientals, signify that all the mysteries are derived from the one source and rest on one base, that of India. The phallus is used by the Freemasons in the degree of master where it is designated by the word Mahabone. This fin oh, gosh, this word, this fecundation, this fecundation is supposed to take place as follows. Fecundation or the or fecundation. I have never heard this word before. Sorry about that. In the early period of initiation, the seed of the unfertilized grain is dead. The candidate bearing within him this inert seed is a male as he only wears upon his breast the compass emblem of the membrum viral. He is stretched upon a mattress or in a coffin or ditch, emblematic of the bed of the pastos or the mysteries of generation. Neither the second nor the first warden can endow him with life. Alone, the worshipful master, wearing upon his chest the square, symbol of the genitalia mulieris, representing the female, the lodge, can fertilize the seed by leaning over the candidate who, representing the male, unites him with the five points of perfection. The seed is fertilized by the union of the male and the female, and the lodge becomes pregnant of the candidate, which she brings into the world nine months later as perfect master, fourth degree, it is being established that nine full months must have passed since the aspirant had received the degree of Master Mason. In summing up, the bases on which are founded the first three degrees of practical masonry are that of that the apprentice, Boaz, the personification of Osiris or the Bacchus, coming to search for truth in the lodge, finds that he is a male god and incomplete for the generation of beings that the companion Jackin, personification of Isis or Venus, the female god, completes the male god by rendering possible the generation of beings, that the master Mahabon or Macbenek is the hermaphrodite, complete son of Lot, and his daughter, son of the sun and the earth, and that because one all originates by generation and not by creation, which is the only simple induction of generation. Two, corruption or destruction follows generation in all its works. Three, regeneration restores under the forms, under other forms, the effects of destruction. The formula of the three first degrees of Freemasonry is therefore the incomplete man, the profane, by initiation 
later as perfect master, fourth degree, it being established that... Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't turn the page. Let me start that over again. The formula of the three first degrees of Freemasonry is therefore the incomplete man, the profane, by initiation in Freemasonry, becomes Boaz and is completed by Jack in the Lodge, which restores his corrupted divinity in Mahabon. The special Masonic significance of the flamboyant star or seal of Solomon in Masonry is essentially a creative element. Man reclining represents a protuberance in the middle. Woman reclining, on the contrary, represents a cavity in the middle. The two enlaced form the, um, the flamboyant star. Small wonder that Mackey states that no eunuch can be initiated a mason. Unfortunately, many corrupt and vicious persons seek Masonic protection, and it is to the interest of all such aspirants to power this to encourage vice and corruption through blackmail, using their votaries in the sect to further their own private ends. This is the fundamental danger inherent in all secret societies, whatever the reputation where power is the object. A Mason is said to demit from the order when he withdraws from all connection with it. It relieves the individual from pecuniary contributions and debars him from pecuniary relief, but it does not cancel his Masonic obligations nor exempt him from that wholesome control which the order exercises over the moral conduct of its members. In this respect, the Mason is once a Mason, always a Mason. The fact that a Mason, not a member of any particular lodge, but who has been guilty of immoral or unmasonic conduct, can be tried and punished by any lodge within, those juris within whose jurisdiction he may be residing is not to be doubted. Quoting Brother Moore from Moore's Magazine, Volume 1, page 36, again, every Mason is bound to obey the summons of a lodge of Master Masons, whether he be a member or otherwise. This obligation on the part of an individual clearly implies a power in the lodge to investigate and control his conduct in all things which concern the interest of the institution. The clipping from the Daily Telegraph of October 15, 1930, which we, reprodu which we reproduce herewith, shows the organization of a Masonic bu bureaucracy within our midst, an imperium, in imperio, of political office holders and magistrates, pledge first to Freemason Freemasonry, then possibly to the people. Brighton Borough Lodge Consecrated The Brighton Borough Lodge of the Freemasons, the first of its kind in the province of Sussex, was consecrated today by the Provincial Grand Master Major R. L. Thornton. The lodge will comprise past and present members of Brighton Town Council and Magistrates, and the present mayor, Councillor H. W. Aldrich, as its first master. The installation of the Worshipful Master was performed by the Deputy Provincial Grand Master, Dr. H. Jervis, who was an alderman and past mayor of Brighton. The mayor-elect, Alderman S. C. Thompson, will be the first to initiate. Other officers are... Okay, I'm not going to name all those... So that was chapter 26. Next time we'll do chapter 27.